Hi there, this is Bianca Lopez and this is Be In The No Show brought to you by OWI and Tail. And I am in Vegas with a fellow Canadian, Michelle. Welcome to the show. Thank I'm so you. excited. I'm so happy to be here. So Michelle's the CEO of a really up and coming company called Shift Network. If you haven't looked it up, it's actually Canadian and pretty amazing and they're changing identity and verified credentials using blockchain. Michelle, yes. tell me about Shift and then you need to tell me about you after. Tell me about Shift, because it's what you do and you work relentless hours in this company, so tell me all about it. So Shift, I am the Chief Client Officer, so uh, we have, or I will say Chris Forrester, because I'd like to say her name, uh, our CTO comes from the gaming space, and she took uh, Ethereum and basically forked Ethereum, added 15 different opcodes, so that it would help um, different apps and different organizations to essentially help in GDPR and open banking, where it's consent-driven platform. Okay. Really trying to make sure that end users have the rights to their data and have a right to basically share the consent and have that consent be auditable. Um, so that really, at the end of the day, what is the biggest problem in today's world? It's identity, hence why you're here in Vegas. Um, and being identity, we really need to find a solve in how we really enable the end user to have their rights back and not have to go to a hotel in Vegas and give them your passport to sign in. I know, and then they take it away. Yeah. And like go, over, like it's, it's insane. It's like there's been this shift of power. So is that what Shift Network is trying to do? Bring back the power of the data to the consumer or to the enterprise? Really to the end user. We're really okay. trying to, uh, the, the whole concept in mind is really to give the end user power and not just through a Shift wallet, but really with our ability to give the functionality of our wallet um, to other wallets and other apps to really, it doesn't have to be Shift, mm -hmm. it has to be the functionality of Shift to basically allow people to share that consent uh, in their data, whichever data points is necessary. You talked about a really interesting problem in terms of data and, and the data sets need to be interoperable. Even though you started with Ethereum, one of the things that I understand and please explain us further is yeah. the interoperability of the platform. Yeah, so one of the biggest features that we have is the bridging tool. So really, you can bridge from Shift to other blockchains. Uh, and the goal is really to be interoperable. So if you were to use an EID, uh, it can be interoperable and it can be shared. Um, and I can move it with me as correct. I go along. And then can I give consent as a black box and not share the data? Like, can I share attributes and like, how does it work? So really Shift has, uh, we don't have any data stored on the blockchain whatsoever. So Lessening, no PII, no, PII, no identity in the blockchain as a solution. Okay, Correct. carry on. The only thing that will be <laughs> on the blockchain is the consent um, and the attestation. So the attestation is only the Merkle tree, so it's not the actual data points, to get a little technical. Love um, it. But really what we're trying to do is use trust anchors within a new data market mm -hmm. um, that the Shift uh, blockchain allows for. So this data does not have to be PII data, it could be research data. It, we're talking to people from an R&D perspective where they need to share this data between inter between universities and they this need to This is incredible, because that's what I talk about people all the time. I've had this conversation with one of my greatest mentors, um, um, and talk to him about how do we build this black box where I can put my data, you can put your data, and the yeah. insights from that shared pool come out. I don't need to know what I put in there. Correct. Or you don't need to have access because like that's how things like a true blacklist will come or customer-driven insights will really exist and not just be a buzzword. Is that yeah. where you're trying to get to? Yeah, so we, we have a partner that actually does store data. Okay. So we realize that there's you know compliance for FinTrack and all of these different aspects when you're sharing things like KYC, AML. Mm -hmm. uh, so we partnered with a company called Burst IQ and they are basically allowing for the data to be stored with them securely for five years and then you just show the attribute. And it's just an option, so we do have some preferred partners within that aspect, but really what you're sharing is just the attestation. And when you're signing on to an app, it will ask you what it needs from a data perspective. You choose those points in which trust anchor you want to use as your core trust. And then and it's, it allows me to pick that concierge service for that particular interaction. So right. I can say my trust anchor for this interaction is Michelle or a credited entity. 
Correct. Um, largely, uh, at this point, it won't be an individual. It okay. will be another entity. So it's okay. taking an individual and authenticating them through a trust anchor, which can be many different things, but it is normally So an what entity. are some of the ecosystems that you're hoping to build? I know you've been in talk with governments and yes. them as trust anchors. Where do you see this ecosystem going? Can telcos be trust anchors? Yes. Are they the discretionary manager and the trust anchor? Where do you see a little bit of the future here so, of what you can share? Yeah, so when you look at like a government, right? That's that's a perfect sandbox, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're working with a the government, then you have the alignment of the other trust anchors, which you will you'll need, right? Like you'll want a telco, you'll want an insurance company, you'll want a bank. Um, but are current banks the ones who want to participate in this state? Maybe not yet. So you might need fintechs uh, yeah. who want to play. Where in do this you space. see the banks today with like their true actual understanding, without bashing any of your beloved bank clients? Uh, where do you see their, their and their understanding of really an implementation of a system that way? Because it's, you're talking about a massive infrastructure change, or if nothing else, a data side change. Yeah, and I'll speak to more like the smaller countries, right, where they have challenges because all of their data records are physical. Right? Wow. So when you don't think of yeah. that challenge that occurs, and even like other countries that we're talking to, a lot of their post offices and, and their data is still that paper piece. So okay. um, you've, you've got So like a really hurdles. big point of failure. So they're yeah. like, for the love of God, do anything with this. Like anything is better. Right, but it's, so sort of it's like educating them. them, right? Educating them that you need data um, that has to be digital and then sharing it. And then when you look at like a bigger bank who's in this game and trying to figure out how to share, it's are your compliance rules sufficient to my compliance rules and do I trust the way that you've done your back due diligence yeah. for me to want to share? So I think like when you look at this space, A, it's gonna be a, a different infrastructure visual of yeah. like, yeah, I trust what you've facilitated. And with that um, potential 2% that I may not trust, how do I have an other trust anchor um, that's accessible to me? How do to I sort elevate. of supply demand build this game and this ecosystem? Correct, and utilize what you feel is relevant based on your back end. And I, I think, A, the reg regulatory ruling has to alter slightly for us to be successful within this space. And that's that was my next question to you. You like read my mind. Where do you think are the regulators in this space? So like how far along are they? Because like I know, and we don't do a good enough job. Like in our industry, we, 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 we have news, we have press releases, we don't educate anybody. So like, I don't blame them completely. No, and I think like even in my old space, I come from prepaid cards and there's a lot of regulatory ruling on prepaid cards because it's a hot topic and, mm -hmm. and people are scared where that financial trail is, is coming from. Um, but I think more of them need to attend events like this so that they could hear from the source and from the startups what's happening and what's needed. Yeah. Uh, so they can have an ear to the ground of what the future needs to look like. And yes, I understand they need to be protective and they need to kind of hold what they believe to be a conservative truth, yeah. but they also need to kind of look at but what's you, But you look, at, you look at so many of them, like I've had the privilege of sort of traveling everywhere, and you look at most data protectionist laws, they date they, they back to like the 2000s. They're yeah. nowhere future-proofing anything. So like for those of you that organize conferences, build a conference to teach or talk to regulators about what are some of this sort of mega trends that are gonna happen that are actually happening already. Like, cloud yeah. storage like there's not regulation on a lot of these things today so is that an impediment as a startup it is an impediment but i think there because the guys in the bank are probably going yeah My hands are tied until the regulator tells you that like that is the innovation like that challenge as a door, startup <laughs> i would say but i think that's why you have to look about it like in a different way like how do you highlight what the platform can facilitate yeah we want devs to come and build on our platform because we don't just see it as like a shift um B you truly see play. it as an open source idea of like, come build on top, come innovate, Absolutely. let the best win. Absolutely, because I think at the end of the day, you win through collaboration. So totally. there's a lot of partners that we're talking to that we're trying to figure out, you know, how can they elevate because of us? How do we elevate together? And, mm -hmm. and that's where success, I think, occurs. And I think blockchain actually is one of the, the few industries that are looking at like we are better together. Totally. Um, so I, I definitely, I definitely see, I definitely see that conversation in terms of it's not one that will win. Let's just try to get people to be educated on what this is and that this is the new way data infrastructures thinking. are going to be done. Yeah, and I think it's it's like 
this conversation should have happened 10 years ago, like the ones that are happening today, yeah. right? Because we're well, trying we can to only we can only do what we can do now. At least we're trying, so pay yes. attention. <laughs> and I, I think, like, as we try and like move forward uh, to to solving, how do we protect my kids and their identity and what they give out online? And and I think that's where they we give need to so start. much online. So much. I tell and they my have kids, multiple profiles. Like so many profiles. It's and I tell one my for kids, you, yeah. one for their friends, one for the school, one for the real gnarly things that they might do. Let's hope not too much of that. <laughs> not but... yours. Yours are well behaved, my friends. My friends' kids do that all the time. It's just scary. Like, I literally have said to them, give a different birth date every time you sign up to an app. Like, yeah. there's no point that an app needs to know your birthday. But nor should they have to live in a world where this is what's requested of them to get access to a service that people make more money than right. their value might be worth, right? Like, I think we need this, like, entire change of what is my data and what is my identity and like you don't need to know my birthday right like it's, this is my game my rules you should just know what i'm willing to give you but together. that data economy has to change yeah and i think the overarching view of how we deal with who we are and what protection we need to hold against our identity needs to change yeah. and i think like i was talking to one of my competitors um, and I, I think it's it's good to have those conversations because they're between a chicken and an egg. If the end consumer is not ready to be the owner of their data, yeah. right? And be it's a terrifying charge. thing. I think most people are not even ready still to have, be the owner of their own financial well-being. Which is even scarier. Which then to thought. me, but but it is right. Like right. if and I think if you follow the rule of like, you believe data is the new oil, the new money, the new whatever. It, yeah what is the literacy that needs to happen in today's education for when I do have kids that they will learn about this stuff. Yeah. So, I, they're, so they're at least can consciously decide, okay, I trust this entity to take care of it for me, or I don't. I don't think today we even grasp, we, and we are stuck in this world of like convenience and SSOs and like, I just want to Google Facebook, like log in with Facebook, log in with Google, off to the races. Yeah. We are also used to like, accept terms and conditions. We roll, like, I don't read it. No. And well, I'm in the industry, well, I will it's bad. Share. I started reading it, but it's just bad. I started reading it when my daughter downloaded Snapchat and handed okay. it over to me to put in my password. And when I read the T's and C's, it gave them the authorization to take all of my, every message I've ever typed and every message that I will type in the future, whether I'm on the app or not, they have access to that. And so. this isn't a pick on Snapchat, but it's actually a pick on the industry. So how do we Sorry. also make that super interesting? But right? Like that should be like, an education. That should, should be an easy user experience. It should be like a game. Well, it should be illegal to <laughs> yes, basically that too. have access to anything on your phone other than what is necessary during the time that For you're you to using provide that me app. the service. Correct. I like even that. like I wrote an article talking about this like only in the app allowed. Correct. It should just be the default. default. It should be the default standard that you should never be able to facilitate anything. To, to get me anywhere. It's just like sneaky and it's wrong. And I just, I honestly, we're just going on a rant here, but like, I honestly hate it. Like, no, I don't know I how the industry changed. And I think this is like conversations like this, but I actually think we need to go down to the consumer level. Well, I think there needs to be a regulatory body that makes that a regulatory ruling because I yeah, think they're agreed. focusing on things like prepaid that is already very regulated, but they're not focusing on like what apps need to have more regulation against them. And Apple and Google should be at the forefront of that because they have access to what apps are approved or not approved to be on their platforms. Exactly. Or then we can talk about Facebook and Twitter being a publishing house, not a tech company. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a personal question. How did you get, Michelle, like how did you get into this business? Yeah. Um, so and how did you now, an identity blockchain hashtag, all the best Canadian lady? <laughs> um, I, I think at the end of the day, um, when you're in different industries, you kind of learn uh, and go to different events. And um, by being in the prepaid space and being in Canada and running events like like No in a smaller version in Canada, you get to really know different uh, companies. Be proud, running an event in Canada. Women do this all the time. I'm not letting Michelle do this. <laughs> she ran kick-ass events and she's very connected. And payments is an infrastructure that most people need to understand it needs to be connected to identity. It really does. And I think it's an easy flow. So I came from payments um, and in that payments industry, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure that's now touching identity, that's now touching blockchain, that's touching AI, like fintech. So really essentially, I'll give a little life hack. Um, I was at an organization for three Tip years. Tip number one from Michelle. <laughs> Go. 
<laughs> uh, I was at a company for three years and I was at a plateau. From a Canadian perspective, unless I wanted to move to the US, that's as high as I could go. I loved my people, I loved my boss, um, but it was time to kind of like, hey, what, el what else is out there? So I took a FinTech course um, at Ivy League Business School. It wasn't a fortune, it was a three-day course, an 80-hour mm -hmm. pre-read, but it was a phenomenal course that gave um, a really great insight on FinTech, on blockchain, on AI, and what was happening in the world. And I think sometimes like, you just need to touch down and start that learning experience so that you take yourself to an uncomfortable place. And I ended up with all the SVPs of all the Canadian banks and myself. Like this was like a, a fluke course and it just, in, in, like the interest of everything that was out there yeah. uh, in the industry of fintech, which really then touched everything, uh, got my eyes open. And then um, someone that I knew in the loyalty space had reached out a couple times for a job um, named Bruce Silkoff, who's our CEO. And hey, this is a plug for Bruce being really good at recruiting kick-ass chicks. So definitely, he had come to me with a couple job offers, but his last company was all male, mm -hmm. and I kept saying no. And he's no. just like, no. You were like, no, I'm no. not doing it. How, how was that? Why was that? Why were you just literally saying no because there's no chicks, and you were just like, nope, not doing not it? Not doing it. So my, my CEO, or the head of Canada for Incom, is Felipe Papaleo, and I will give him a, a shout out because he's amazing. His wife- We have lots of people to tag in this episode now. Yes. Like, there's a shout out list this big, go. So he's Brazilian okay. uh, and his wife is, is a phenomenal woman and he core believes that a team should be 50-50. So when he hired me, um, his team was 50-50 uh, from an executive level in Canada and it, we were such an effective team. We really helped alter what was happening in Incom Canada and change the brand of Incom Canada over three years. So when I knew that I was kind of looking and I took that FinTech course, uh, I knew you were like, I'm not it. joining 50, without 50-50. Is, is like where that action of success occurs. Um, and when Bruce came to me and offered me a C-level position, I said the first question, so what's your team look like? And he's like, our marketing head is, is female. I hate that answer. Can you all stop female. with this question that is like your marketing person? No offense to marketing people. I love marketing people. And I own a t like a comms company. But... But we didn't but stop that, there. But that's, that, that's not that's where, not just that's not where so you're So it's head due. of marketing, head of sales, and head of, our head CTO, Chris Forrester. Also All female. chicks. All chicks. So, so you're like, I'm in. Yeah. Bring that, me on. That was th that and the blockchain and what Chris, like, what Chris's mission was and what she built Shift um, infrastructure for was really end user power. I've read 1984. I want us to turn the tables and find Same. a way to, to like, give the end user power. Um, so. All right, so power to us and you. Get educated, go learn, and be in the know. And thank you, Michelle, for thank coming you. on the show.